Hello, I'm Bill O'Donnell and welcome to another program on spirituality. Uh, today we're going to have part two of our recent conversation with Monsignor Jerome Martinez y Elire, the rector of St. Francis Cathedral Basilica in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Welcome back, Monsignor. It's good to be back. <laughs> uh, it went by very fast, didn't it? Yes, it sure did. Okay, well we had some changes here, so you might, if you saw part one, you'll notice there are some changes to the set. Uh, in part one, we did talk a little bit about Monsignor's background, that he was a 13th generation New Mexican, born and raised in Santa Fe, went to school at St. Anne's Parochial School and at St. Mike's High School, and then later joined the seminary uh, at Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary here in Santa Fe. By the way, who was your rector? Uh, Frank Eggert. Oh, he was, Father, Father Frank. Father Frank Eggert, still okay. pastor in Albuquerque. At yeah. Our Lady of Fatima. Yes. And I imagine his predecessor, the late Monsignor Hill, who was a favorite of ours, was also there. Yes, he was. Okay. That's just for the people who have been around a while. Uh, so tell us, a lot of things have happened, um, things that we didn't cover last time. We want to talk about a little more of your youth. After you, uh, you were ordained, when? I was ordained in 1976. I am celebrating my 30th anniversary. This year will be great. We'd love to have you back to talk about that. Yeah. And later in the segment, we will show a clip from his 25th uh, anniversary of ordination at the cathedral, which is a lot of fun. Uh, Father Frank Preto has a few things to share about the Monsignor. And, uh, oh, no. <laughs> I know, but it was, it was pretty funny. But one was a vision that we're going to share. That's later in this segment. Um, so you, you got to seminary. You graduated from College of Santa Fe in history. Your, your, That's correct. In your history. Why did you choose history as a major? Uh, history for me is kind of a natural. If you're studying religion, mm -hmm. uh, religion is basically the history of salvation. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, so history is basically a great big story, uh -huh. you know, of where we've come from and where we are and where we hope to go on. And I remember when you uh, celebrated the funeral mass for a former teacher of yours, the late Don Pedro Rivera Ortega, I remember you said at that time that you were thinking about English literature as your major until you had one class from Pedro. That's right, and he gave me a, an indication as to how important history was in my own sense of self. That for a long time I had been uh, ashamed of being New Mexican because um, of prejudice and, and racism kind of to, made, to feel that uh, I did not have much to offer. But when he taught me about uh, New Mexican history and mm -hmm. gave me a sense of pride and my own people's accomplishments, that was where I wanted to go. That's amazing. And you mentioned the last time that you were not only part Hispanic, but also part Native American. Yes, I have a part Apache through my mother's mother. Mm -hmm. And Pedro also had Native American as yes. well. But now those days are over, aren't they? I mean, we've come through that, and now it's something to celebrate, it seems. Yes, uh, there's still some uh, racism and division in Santa Fe, unfortunately, but uh, as new peoples continually come in, they still need to understand the history and the story and mm -hmm. and so most are willing to do that that's the fantastic thing about santa fe yeah. and some are not so uh, we just continue to pray for those okay. well i'm one of those that appreciate you yes. and i'm thankful uh for how welcome you've made me feel i've only yeah. been here i think i first arrived in the late 70s and moved here in the early 70s and moved here in the early 80s and i can't tell you how welcome i felt largely because of the church. So after you were ordained, what was your first assignment? What were you doing? I was uh, assigned to be a rector at the Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary, I should say dean, uh, and I was there for three years. And then after that, I was uh, three years, uh, four years uh, in El Rito, uh -huh. which is a little rural community. Uh, in New Mexico, priests cut their teeth after they're ordained and after an apprenticeship of some sort. They cut their teeth on becoming pastors of these small communities in the rural areas. Yeah, why is that? Well, you're young and you have a lot of energy and uh, usually it requires just a lot of energy to survive up there, you know, chopping your own wood, you know, living a pretty simple poor life, mm -hmm. taking care of lots of missions, traveling back and forth. Uh, it was great. I loved it. But it was a lot of work. I'm not sure I could do it now at <laughs> my age now. <laughs> That's right. In those days, this premature gray uh, be, uh, tells another story. So then from El Rito, where did you go? I was uh, sent to, by the Archbishop to study canon law at Catholic University of America in uh, D.C., and then after that I became the Chancellor of the Diocese, and I did that for four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very challenging, reorganizing uh, the Chancery or the administrative headquarters of the Diocese in such a way 
that it would be uh, more effective, more efficient, and more responsive to the needs of the people. Tell the folks here just how many parishes and missions the Archdiocese yes. is responsible for. The Archbishop of Santa Fe uh, oversees 92 parishes and about 300 mission churches. A parish is a, is a big center where the Catholics come. It's under the direction of a resident priest. Missions are little churches that are attached to that um, uh, big church and uh, don't have a resident priest, but a priest takes care of them uh, either monthly or quarterly or weekly. I have a mission, two missions from the cathedral, that's Cerrillos and Galisteo. Mm -hmm. But you said in El Rito you had 10 missions? I had 10 missions. I used to put on 40,000 miles a year uh, traveling in my little Subaru station wagon, and uh, that was mostly over dirt roads in the mountains. Uh, Monsignor Hill, when he was here, talked about having to do it on horseback yes. uh, when he came from, uh, came from the Netherlands. So now you, and then from there, where did you go after you? Uh, after being chancellor, <clears throat> I was uh, given the privilege of starting this new parish at, in Santa Fe, Santa Maria de la Paz. And uh, we broke away from St. John's, which had ended up being a very large parish, and the bishop wanted to, to split that so that they get more personal service. And so um, we were given the southern part of the city to serve. Mm -hmm. And we uh, chose um, Pinon Elementary School Gymnasium to be the site where we would have Mass for four years. We had no church, we had nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started saying Mass there, and we grew rapidly from about 200 families to 800 families. Mm -hmm. And then we decided we'd build a church. And uh, we built the church that's here on Richards Avenue right now. Mm -hmm. And the church was blessed with more growth, and so we ended up having 2,400 families by the time I left. And um, it continues to grow now under Father Adam. Yeah. And it will obviously because of the new, the new school, the new regional school. Maybe this is the time to talk a little bit about that. Yes, as you know, the uh, Catholics in, the, in New Santa Fe uh, constitute about half the population of the city. And uh, Catholics usually and have historically been uh, great family producers, you know. And uh, we have a lot of children. Um, but the only two Catholic elementary schools that serve Santa Fe that have survived after the many that we used to have, we used to have a Catholic school in every parish at one time in Santa Fe. And we used to have many other high schools, you know, that were here. Each of them have closed because of financial strains. And our two schools have survived, but they're on the wrong side of town, literally, because the east side, downtown, doesn't have a lot of kids. It's the least kid-bearing population in the whole city. So we had to end up uh, making a rather momentous decision to, to consolidate those two schools into one and make it a regional school and move the regional school to the south side where all the kid-bearing population is mm -hmm. and where Santa Fe's future is. Right. right now, the center of population in Santa Fe uh, demographically is um, St. Michael's Drive, but it's rapidly moving to Rodeo Road. And so the church has to be there to serve the people where they're at. And so the bishop decided to take a loan to build uh, this Santo Nino Regional Catholic School, $11 million. It'll be a school that will be able to house 550 kids. It will be state of the art. So we're really trying to ensure that Catholic education has a vibrant future in Santa Fe as it has had a glorious past. I was a beneficiary of a parochial grammar school as well, and I assume you were too. Talk about that. Why is it important to send kids at a young age to parochial school? What's the advantage? Well, they get a tremendous education. First of all, uh, the smaller classes, you know, allow more individual attention. Second of all, uh, the, um, there's a sense of discipline. You know, there's a tremendous kind of partnership between the parents and the teachers in a Catholic school that we want our kids to be fully formed, not just academically or socially or sports-wise, but we want them to be fully formed. And so there's a discipline, you know, there's a partnership between the parents and the teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, that discipline provides for a good learning environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we have teachers coming to us from the public school saying that they prefer to teach in a, public, in a Catholic school even though they're getting a cut in pay but because it's a safer and a more disciplined environment where they can actually fulfill their mission as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then, and foremost, is that we provide faith formation in, um, in a Catholic school. We don't have to apologize for opening the day with prayer. 
we don't apologize for having a Christmas pageant, not a winter pageant. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we involve the whole person in the formation, and that means our spiritual development. Mm -hmm. Because um, in, in 20 years when these kids are graduated and married and have you know, their own kids, uh, they may not remember algebra, or uh, they may not remember some of the things that they learn in school, but they should have learned and remembered some of the faith things that kept them through and give them the strength to get through the hard times. So that's why we believe in, in making the sacrifice to having a Catholic school. Uh, good point. Let's take you back home to your primary responsibility as rector of the cathedral, which has now become a basilica. Can you tell us a little about the folks at home that don't know what that means and what's, what's actually happened here? Well, the cathedral is a very important church. It is the church of the bishop. Uh, the bishop actually is the pastor. Mm -hmm. The priest assigned to take his place is the rector. Basically, that means I direct the uh, church on the behalf of the archbishop. Mm -hmm. you know? But it, it is his church, and for that reason, it is the mother church of all the other 92 parishes in this diocese. And the term cathedral comes from the uh, Greek, which means cathedra, uh, which means chair, the teaching chair of the bishop. And so in every cathedral, it, there's the prominent chair or throne where the bishop teaches the Catholic faith, where, where he hands on what he has been given, you know, on that long succession of the apostles. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, that's the nature of a cathedral. And by its very nature, that's a great honor. But uh, Pope Benedict XVI decided to honor the cathedral even more by naming it a basilica. What's a basilica? It's a church that's been uh, named by the Pope, chosen to be held up before the universal church for its importance in its art, its history, or its impact on the faith. And uh, St. Francis a Cathedral certainly qualifies on all those uh, levels. Its art, it includes some of the most beautiful modern, you know, Hispanic Santero art, it also has some of the greatest uh, examples of the Mexican Baroque, such as paintings that come from 1710 by Pascual Perez and Elisa Cochea. And it is also known for its history. It's been here 400 years, like I mentioned last week. It is uh, the, one of the oldest uh, Christian congregations in the United States. And then also its impact on the faith. Uh, from St. Francis Cathedral Basilica went the lay people that founded almost all the communities in northern New Mexico, including Albuquerque, including Santa Cruz. And also the missionaries, the priests that went from here to found parishes all over the southwest, and the bishops that went from here to found new dioceses like in Tucson or Denver. So it can literally be called the cradle of Catholicism for the whole southwest. And it was the, that the reason for which the Pope wanted to honor it as a basilica. And his predecessor, John Paul II, said that very thing to us. You remember when you were yes. chancellor, yes. you arranged for him to speak to us yes. from his plane, the first time a chief of state mm. had ever done that. By the way, I'd love to get a copy of that tape sometime. Yes. He said those exact words. Yes, we are the cradle of Catholicism for the Southwest, and for that reason, um, he sent us the decree, and uh, we, were, we were named a basilica. So it's now the Cathedral Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. It's just another title for a very old and venerable community of faith and its building. That's true. But it even makes it more of a magnet, hopefully. Yes. And it also of the site of the oldest Marian shrine in yes. the country, continuous. Yes, we have the oldest statue or representation of the Virgin Mary in the United States in Our Lady of Peace. She was brought here in 1625. I have to tell you that that's the, probably the most visited spot in the whole cathedral. Mm -hmm. Many, many people make pilgrimages there mm -hmm. to pray to her. Mm -hmm. And we have a great history of supernatural intervention, it seems, for healing and mm. things, not only at the cathedral, but at uh, nearby Chimayo. Yes. Processions that come and go and start symbolically from the cathedral, much, much of that. Yeah, I think sometimes other Santa Feans that are not um, Catholic will see Catholics, you know, going in these long, what seems like a parade, but it isn't. <laughs> you know, it's a procession, and a procession is very well organized. It's a, it's a, it's a journey. And, and thereby it's a pilgrimage. It starts off with the cross because Jesus is leading the way and then the whole community of faithful is kind of supporting each other in prayer and uh, keeping each other's spirits up. And uh, then the patron saint is carried too because they're companions on the journey. And then you have the clergy at the very end 
to make sure that no one is lost, mm. that no one is dropped behind. So processions in San African and in Hispanic uh, Catholic devotion are nothing less and nothing more than a, a small capsulization of our pilgrimage of life mm. through this valley of tears, led by the Lord Jesus, accompanied by the faithful, you know, surrounded by the saints and protected by the clergy. And here you are. Ta-da! <laughs> as you look back on your going on now 30 years as a priest, did you have any idea what your life would have been like once you made that decision to study for the priesthood? Uh, no, actually. Uh, it's all a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I never thought I would have been involved in the repair of a mission church like I was up in El Rito or that I would have been the rector of the cathedral. You know, I was just a kid from the West Side Barrio here in, uh, mm -hmm. in Santa Fe, but uh, the Lord always has a way of surprising you. And He's continually surprised me, and I think pleasantly. That's true. There was one moment, I, we haven't talked about other things like retreats. You just recently had to do, you got to do a 30-day Ignatian retreat just in the few minutes we have left. I remember that look on your face before you left and when you came back. You were like a refreshed new man. It was incredible. Tell us a little about your time. Well, I think uh, people who are in the ministry can end up losing sight of what they're in it for. I think sometimes couples that are married get that same impression. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're married and they forget why they got married and they fall out of love with each other. And um, Parents sometimes go through that too with their kids. Why did I have this kid in the first place? Uh, well, priests uh, over the years sometimes can get burned out and forget why they went through it. So you need to go back and renew a second honeymoon, so to speak. Mm. And so I went uh, for a 30-day retreat in silence and solitude just to touch base once again with the Lord who called me to be a priest in the first place. It was wonderful. What can you tell us about your experience? You just have a couple minutes left. It was a, a great uh, time to center as well as to wean myself away from the constant rat race of ministry and life in this society that keeps you distracted from that very center point of view where God wants to love you. Mm. And that's where you get your strength to minister. Otherwise, you're ending up doing a lot of holy things and never becoming holy. You have to keep that relationship, that prayer life going. Mm. Well, very good. Because I see that in you when you're celebrating Mass. There's that moment. It's almost like a restful period for you when you're, mm. when you're celebrating a sacrament because yes. you have that moment where all the other thing is now superfluous and you're in that moment which means the most to you. I just... Uh, it's a privilege to be a priest. Okay. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes. Privilege to be a priest. How about a word for vocations? Uh, what, what advice would you have for parents or grandparents or kids? You know, I can't imagine anything that would uh, challenge you more and fulfill you more than to being a priest. Um, uh, I am privileged to be at all the important moments of a person's life. At their birth, uh, when they get married, when they die, and to be able to bring the face of God in a human form to those kind of situations and to bring them a message of God's love. It's uh, something I don't deserve, but certainly I enjoy doing. Well, that's great. We enjoy having you. Well, I, I want you to stay tuned. We're going to roll a little bit of footage from uh, Monsignor Jerome's uh, 25th anniversary. I want you folks at home to be able to see what some of his fellow priests think of him and the people uh, that he serves think of him in a little short uh, piece from his 25th uh, anniversary of ordination at the cathedral and I think you're going to like it and I hope that uh, this program has been of some value to you. We'd love to hear from you so please watch the credits, give us a call, let us know what you think and if you believe in this sort of thing we'd love to hear from you. So on behalf of everybody here at Spirituality, our director Marshall, cameras Tom and Wendy and of course our special guest Monsignor Jerome, I want to thank you for viewing and enjoy this little bit of history at the cathedral with Monsignor Jerome and Father Frank Preto officiating at that moment. So thank you for viewing. And the Corinthians were an odd lot, an odd lot. But in this letter, Paul firmly tells the Corinthians in chapter 12, and I quote, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit that gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord that is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to everyone for their service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each one for the good.
good of all." Unquote. Then he proceeds to spell out the various gifts uh, that each Christian receives. But folks, many of us have received one gift, no? Many of us have been privileged to receive maybe a couple of gifts. But you know something? Jerome Martinez got the whole piñata, the whole enchilada. He got so many gifts. I mean, look at his resume, just for instance. A doctoral degree in canon law, an expert in canon law. An expert in history, not just in church history, but in world history. You know, most of us, to pass the time, we go for a drive, we watch TV, we go to the mall. You know what Jerome does? He reads history books. That's how he spends his time. A master builder. Jerome, with the help of his parishioners, built the latest parish in Santa Fe, which is now listed as one of the 300 finest, most active, most productive, and desirous parishes to be a part of in the entire United States, Santa Maria de la Paz.
We love you because your love and devotion to your family, especially to your late mother, Nelda, whom I am sure is with you as we give you the honor you deserve. And finally, your love and devotion to God's word, which you have made your own. And that word is, God loves us all. As the article in last week's newspaper attests, Father Jerome did not become a priest out of vain glory or because he was afraid to go to hell or some other reason. He became a priest for God's people to bring people together in love. Jerome, I wish you, as they say in Latin, ad multos annos. Congratulations and thank you for the wonderful person that you are. And thank you all, folks. Thank you.